there were carbs, right? There was grains and some berries, but it just was not the same context. We were not eating three meals a day plus snacks with like all the, all just loaded with corn syrup and sugar and everything. So I don't know if we were like ancestrally purely ketogenic diet. I don't do the pure keto diet. I don't know if ancestrally people were like never, ever, ever touching a carb and always, always in the state of ketosis where their body was making ketones. But we, safe to say we had elevated ketone levels compared to the average person today. Hello, and welcome to the Art of Living Well podcast. I'm Stephanie May Potter, and I'm here with my co-host, Marnie Dotchis marmet We created the Art of Living Well podcast to empower you to live your happiest, healthiest, and most authentic life. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and motivating conversations covering health and wellness topics, including fitness, mindset, food, travel, product reviews, and strategies from a variety of experts, including our own bank of knowledge. We are excited to educate, motivate, and inspire you to change the way you perceive health and discover your art of living well. Get ready to feel inspired. Hello and welcome to episode 128 of the Art of Living Well podcast. We are so excited that summer is officially here in Minnesota after what was a very long and cold winter. And that means more time outside, socializing, you know, lots of gatherings and just enjoying this beautiful time of year. But that also means that we're approaching our upcoming seven-day functional medicine liver detox, and it'll be here before you know it. It'll kick off on Sunday, July 24th, but you can start whenever it works with your schedule. And for those of you that have been following us and listening for a while, you know we run these quarterly. It's just a really great way to reset those healthy habits that you have to be more intentional about the foods that you're eating and focus on what makes you feel good and what your body needs to thrive. We know a lot of people are up later than normal in the summer months, and that can impact our sleep. So why not take just one week this summer to do something that your body will thank you for and join our seven-day liver detox? We know this time of year can be more challenging to commit to a detox with travel plans and other social gatherings. However, reach out to us because there are many ways to modify it and not make it as challenging during this time of year. So head on over to the show notes and click the link to sign up. And of course, reach out with us if you have any questions. Really, this program is designed just to to eat clean for a week and give your liver some love. It doesn't need to be extreme in any ways. And like I said, there's lots of ways to modify it. So please don't hesitate to reach out. And then the next update I want to share is just in case you haven't heard about our new monthly episode format, we kicked this off a couple months ago and we're going to drop these episodes monthly It's called a Health Transformation Audit, where we're going to bring you, our community members, onto the show for a 15-minute experience where we'll guide you to identify what's holding you back from your ideal health and wellness, and we'll analyze with you so that you can walk away with a tangible action step. As integrative health practitioners and health coaches, Marnie and I love doing this kind of work with you, so check out episode 121 or 126 to hear from two of our community members Kim and Wendy, who have been on the show for a health transformation audit. And even better, we would love to have you on. So you can click the link in our show notes and sign up for your own personal 15-minute health transformation audit. And now let's welcome today's amazing guest, Michael Brandt, who's the co-founder and CEO of a metabolic health company called HVMN, or Health Via Modern Nutrition. Through Michael's steadfast leadership, HVMN not only launched the world's first drinkable ketone, but is tracking to redefine the limits of human performance, metabolism, and longevity to combat the global metabolic health crisis. Along with his co-founder, the duo secured a $6 million contract from the U.S. Special Operations Command to continue research into the benefits of ketones. The pair gained early interest from pro athletes, including former Olympians and pro racing cyclists. You are going to love today's episode with Michael as we dive into the world of keto. 
Yes, keto diets have been very popular in recent years, but do you really understand what it means to be in ketosis or what ketones are and what ketone esters are? So regardless of whether you've experimented or are on a keto diet or you don't know what one entails, this conversation is going to spark your curiosity. Michael does a fantastic job of explaining ketones and the diet and how our bodies can effectively utilize them in such simple terms that everyone can understand. We talk about how our ancestors relied on ketones for fuel because their access to sugar and carbs, which spikes blood glucose, was limited. At HVMN, they believe that people should spend more time with elevated ketone levels because of the extreme benefits, so they created a beverage to quickly elevate your ketone levels in your body without having to take such such extreme measures. They recognize that maintaining a pure keto diet can be challenging for most people. Michael explains the benefits of taking ketone IQ, including sustained energy, mental clarity, endurance, recovery, weight management, and metabolic health. We also talk about why you don't need to be on a strict keto diet to get the benefits of ketone esters. Marty and I have both used Ketone IQ on numerous occasions and noticed significant benefits with prolonging our intermittent fasting without being hungry or depriving ourselves of food. And I've also noticed that I don't need any caffeine on those days. I take a shot of Ketone IQ. It really gives you this natural boost of energy that helps me to stay more focused and not have an energy crash. So we know you're going to love this conversation with Michael. We had so much fun. And with that, let's jump right into today's episode with Michael Brandt. But first, a quick word from our sponsor, Thrive Chiropractic. I was first introduced to Thrive Chiropractic over five years ago for kinesiology-based food sensitivity testing. I was so amazed by this non-invasive and inexpensive technique that I took my son to have testing done, which confirmed some of his food sensitivities. Both my son and I now have regular tune-ups, and even my leery husband has felt the immense benefits from receiving chiropractic care, including cupping. With over 25 years of clinical experience, the doctors at Thrive Chiropractic, located in Minnetonka, Minnesota, combine their passion for wellness with a strong expertise in effective treatment approaches. When you first come to Thrive Chiropractic, the doctors are focused on helping you feel better as soon as possible and they recognize that one type of treatment or technique does not work for everyone. Your comprehensive exam, personal goals, and individual concerns help the doctors tailor your custom treatment plan for maximum results. Thrive Chiropractic's integrative approach offers holistic and effective healthcare with a full spectrum of complementary products and services, including acupuncture, massage, food sensitivity testing, CBD, and premium supplements. As a special offer, Thrive Chiropractic would like to invite listeners of our podcast to experience the gift of health with a $25 new patient visit, which includes the initial consultation, a comprehensive exam, any necessary x-rays, and first adjustments. Simply visit the website at www.thrivechiromn.com or call 952-746-5612 and reference the Arts of Living Well podcast. When you're seeking effective, non-invasive treatment approaches to support your health goals, let Thrive Chiropractic be your partner in wellness. Call or book online today. Hi, Michael. We are both so excited that we connected through the podcast community. Um, Today's topic is one that Marnie and I haven't touched on yet in a previous episode, and we know that people are really going to be very interested in learning more about the world of keto. And we know that this conversation is going to really be eye-opening for many of our listeners and just can't wait to share your knowledge and tips and resources with everyone today. So we know everyone has a story and we'd love for you to share your journey in a nutshell of how you ended up in the keto space and ultimately co-founded HVMN. Stephanie and Marnie, thanks so much for having me on and thanks for all the listeners for for listening in. It's great to be here. My story is I am from Chicago originally. I had the good fortune of getting into Stanford for undergrad where I studied product design and computer science. And from there, I, my first job out of college, I was working at YouTube in the heyday of YouTube when it was super popular, fun, fast moving tech company. And 
personally, I was getting into biohacking where I started running a lot. I started getting into personal health optimization. I started looking at nootropics, different ways, you know, beyond caffeine of improving my cognitive function throughout the day. And I was, I took my Stanford computer science engineering hat and I applied it to everything I was doing. So it was very methodological about a B testing different things that I was using as I got into running and I'm now a sub elite marathoner. I run six minute miles for the marathon. I run, Boston, I run the Boston <laughs> yeah. marathon, have run the burning man ultra marathon. I really, I, I get after it. Um, as I know a lot of your listeners do too. Um, uh, and I've been, I've been really rigorous on the tracking of biomarkers along the way. I was able to get good, fast because uh, I was looking at my calories in and my calories out. I was looking at my, how many, my cadence of footsteps on the ground, my heart rate. I'd go on certain runs where run as fast as you can without letting your heart rate go above 140 BPM, go on certain runs in like a fasted state to train my body for the later stages of the marathon. Just be a big nerd ball mm-hmm. about it, biohacker, whatever you want to call it and tracking things rigorously. And from there created this community and my co-founder and I both share the same passion for biohacking, personal health optimization. And we created this community around this and started developing products and our flagship product, we launched a drinkable ketones, the world's first ketone drink. We launched that in 2017 can go into more detail about what that is, but basically if people have heard about, and we can, we'll cover this more, but if people know about the keto diet, it's basically you eat low carb that forces your body to make something called ketones, which feel really good. You feel really sharp, mentally clear, focused, energized, appetite suppressing, but the keto diet itself is really hard to do. You can't ever eat carbs. It's very restrictive. We figured out a way to get many of those exact same benefits in a bottle where you just directly drink a ketone. I'm glossing over a lot of it. Let's, let's dive into that some more, but basically we launched this ketone, the first world's first ketone drink in 2017 In 2019, our first big customer was the U S DOD, the department of defense, special operations command. We secured a $6 million contract to look at ketones for soldier performance in physically and cognitively demanding missions. Ketones are this very special Thing. They cross the blood brain barrier. They can help your muscles with recovery after strenuous events. So they, the special operators have always been interested in it for these advanced performance contexts. What's interesting to me is we're all, we're all doing metabolism all the time. So whether you're a Navy SEAL or a elite athlete, or you're a regular everyday person trying to lose weight or set a PR on your Peloton or, uh, you're an older person that's dealing with cognitive decline. We're all doing metabolism all of the time. So yes, special operators care about it and, and it's an honor to support them. And also we're all doing it all the time. So I think of ketones as the next collagen or omega-3 or caffeine, or when you think of these nutritional primitives that everyone is using, our mission is to make ketones a nutritional primitive that's available and accessible for everyone. Okay. Wow. wow. That was a lot of information. Can we back up for a second? Cause Let's I think our listeners, you, you I think you explained <clears throat> the keto diet very quickly and pretty well. What question I have for you, can you explain to our listeners in more like detail what a ketone is and how it works in the body? Yes. Or what that- it does for a person and maybe just for the average Joe. Yeah. Yeah. A lot in there. And by all means, let's unpack it. What is the keto diet? People have been talking about the keto diet for a lot. It's really come up in the last decade. It it really kind of resurged. The very first applications of the keto diet were actually a century ago. And, And in the early 20th century, there were these kids that were having seizures and the researchers, doctors thought that it had to do with the brain's inability to metabolize glucose, also known as blood sugar, also known as carbohydrates. 
So they try this intervention called the ketogenic diet, where when you do the ketogenic diet, you stop eating carbs, sugar, glucose, all the same thing. You stop eating all pasta, fruit, candy, anything that has sugar in it, you stop eating it. And that forces your body to make something called ketones, which are from fat. They're from your body's fat stores. You, you turn fat into ketones and they have a different profile than carbohydrates. They're more efficient. They turn into energy in your cell. If people remember their high school biology class, the mitochondria is the PowerPoint of the, the power plant of the cell. Uh, you make ATP, which is the cellular currency of energy in your cells. You make ATP more efficiently from ketones. So they're, they go into your cells, mitochondria, just like a sugar, just like a glucose, but they do it more efficiently. So people have been looking at the ketogenic diet for a hundred years. And oh yeah, the outcome of that study in the early 20th century was that when they had these kids go on a ketogenic diet, that they reduced instances of seizures significantly, that, that the hypothesis was right. Like the, these patients for whatever reason had an inability to do glucose metabolism in their brain neurons and by making ketones more available via the ketogenic diet, they were able to recover cognitive ability. If you fast forward a hundred years, like more recently, we've heard about the ketogenic diet, because if you remember when you're making your body make ketones, you're making those ketones from fat. So the first thing that jumps into a lot of people's minds is weight loss. That if, yes, if you stop eating carbs, your body will turn fat into ketones. You will and if you, if you are also eating less than, than you're burning, then those ketones will be coming from your own body fat. And it can be a great way for people to lose weight. That's, I mean, that's a great overview. And I think that helps. And I love, I've heard that, you know, I guess, research study that you mentioned with seizures, um, which I've always found it very fascinating. So, you know, and I know too, just our bodies evolved, right? In a more like keto diet. So our ancestors going back, you know, thousands and thousands of years, primarily use ketones, I think, for yeah. the primary yeah. source of fuel versus glucose. So just thinking how we as humans have evolved and what our bodies are naturally like good at and being efficient, like you said. Yeah, that's right. There's no frosted flakes on the savannah. There is no, <laughs> there, there is no... <laughs> hyper-processed carbs like table sugar is a relatively recent uh-huh. invention mm-hmm. but you didn't have refined sugar it was very hard to find sugar in a natural setting if you think about it like you just didn't have you go into a 7-eleven now and you see a million different like candy options and chips it's all it's all processed carbohydrates 90 like percent of what's in there that just didn't exist in most of human evolutionary history of the last three hundred thousand years and there were carbs, right? There was grains and some berries, but it just was not the same context. We were not eating three meals a day plus snacks with like all the, all just loaded with corn syrup and sugar and everything. So I don't know if we were like ancestrally purely ketogenic diet. I don't do the pure keto diet. I don't know if ancestrally people were like never, ever, ever touching a carb and always, always in the state of ketosis where their body was making ketones, but we safe to say we had elevated ketone levels compared Uh to the average person today because we were not eating as much sugar and we were moving around more to burn off any excess sugar. And that was just inducing our body to make more of its own ketones. So, and I think there's an important point within there, which is a lot of people, when they hear about the keto diet, it's this kind of like black or white thing. It's like, oh, you're either mm-hmm. vegan or not. You're either keto or not. And that's one of the biggest misnomers to that I would like to fix where like, it's actually shades of gray in between. And it's interesting how that's even happened within the vegan movement as an example, where it's now it's called plant-based. And now a lot of mm-hmm. people will reach for a plant-based option throughout the day without like calling themselves a vegan. It's just, they will like, yeah. Hey, if there's a, daring chicken on the menu, they will get that instead without like having to totally wear the like special underpants vegan club. And, (laughs) and I've seen the same thing happen with keto where like 
it used to be this like black and white thing. You're either like this is insane person putting butter in your coffee and eating nothing but avocados and bacon. Not insane, but just like extreme. Like it, that has its place for certain people for certain applications. But there's this whole like there's a whole lot of area in the middle between that and someone who's like eating a ton of soda and candy and junk food and like constantly elevated blood glucose levels to where they have start having metabolic dysfunctions, right? They start having diabetes yeah. and the instances of these types of metabolic diseases are sky high and happening earlier and earlier. The adolescence rate of diabetes is higher than ever. And we, we need to explore that ground in, in the middle. It's more like low carb or have like pizza sometimes, but like don't have a ton of carbs with every single meal, every single day. Like there's a lot of ground in the middle, like get in and out of ketosis throughout the day, like exercise fasted sometimes, like do a eating window where you're fasting for like 16 hours of the day and eating within eight hours of the day, give your metabolism a chance to rebound and process all the, everything that you've eaten, all the elevated carbohydrates that you've eaten in the last day. There's a lot of ground in the middle. So I have a couple of questions about what you're saying, and I just want to make sure I understand this right. So for the, for keto diet, I'm understanding you, you do not subscribe to a strict keto diet. And in fact, your ketone <clears throat> IQ product would be in place of someone being on the keto diet. Is that correct? Because it would give you theoretically the ketones that your body would need that you would get if you were on the keto diet. Am I understanding that right? Yeah, I think you said it. I think you said it really well, Marnie. I want, I want to add, there's some some nuance in there where it's not a direct swap. Like you cannot just eat a donut and then <laughs> right. drink right. ketone IQ. And I'm not saying that that's what you were saying. I just, for, for like clarifying it, that it's, it's not meant to like swap out a healthy low carb lifestyle. It's, it's a compliment to it. It like, yes, it does what the keto diet would do insofar as it elevates your ketones immediately like in 15 minutes, you can, you have elevated ketone levels to the same level as if you were doing the keto diet for several days, it's not going to lose weight for you or like exercise for you. Like right. ketones are still caloric. Like there's still calories inside of ketones, but if you use them in ways where you're using it to like replace other calories and use it, it's more appetite suppressing than the same amount of calories that come from other sources. Um, if you use it in conjunction with other healthy lifestyle decisions, then that's where it can really have an impact. So I love that. I love that that's what the product is doing because I'm also curious, like who do you, you know, in, in your opinion, who do you think the keto diet or some derivation of is good for, you know, um, and how long can someone stay on a keto diet? Cause I think there's just a lot of like buzz out there. Right. And there's people that do it for a short period of time. And then sometimes they end up gaining back all the weight. Cause to your point, it is really hard to follow a strict keto diet. And then just backing up, actually, I'd love for you to explain, like, what does it mean to be in ketosis? Cause I know there's like, you can take those, those urine strips, right. Just for more broad education, I guess, for our listeners. Yeah. That's a good what, question. what does it mean to actually be in ketosis or, you know, on a strict keto diet? Yeah. That's, that's, a good, that's a good question. So, so keto diet is, if we, if we put the slider all the way to the end of the spectrum, this pure keto diet. And again, there's this whole, there's a slider from doing, eating way too much carbs to eating absolutely zero carbs. There's, there's a lot of levels in between, but let's, let's look at all the way at the end of the spectrum where it's keto diet and you're eating no carbs, like it's very low, you know, less than 20 grams of carbs per day, which is yeah, very, like very low. Yeah. That is really good for a few things. That is good. Sometimes on doctor's orders for therapeutic reasons, doctor will have you do it. Um, sometimes it's an adjunct to cancer therapies because certain types of cancers thrive off of carbohydrates and don't thrive off of fats and ketones. It can be used for aggressive weight loss. There's something about the keto diet that is very like the like fats tend to be more satiating per calorie. Like if you think about it, you have like 500 calories of a steak and eggs. It like sticks to your ribs. It like fills you up more than 500 calories of bread. Like the bread, 
pancakes and syrup will 500 calories will make you hungry again 90 minutes later versus if it's just really eggs, avocado, steak, it will fill you up more. So keto diet can work for a lot of people for more overall satiety, appetite suppression, and reducing overall calorie input. And then again, your body gets into this mode where it's burning its own fat and turning it into ketones. Another important note for when we're talking about the keto diet is different people are different. Different people respond to it differently. Like I respond to marathon training a certain way. Like I can't really dunk a basketball. I'm like five, six, but I, I can <laughs> um, run really fast. Like, right. Different people are different. And some people respond and have more metabolic flexibility. Some people love the keto diet and they just, they absolutely love it. Other people, they try it and it's not for them. And it's really hard and they should feel terrible. Other people are in the middle where it's like, they feel terrible for a week and then they come through to the other side and then they start feeling really good. So it's one of those things that depends for different people. What you're saying is an insight. Like people will try it out for you know a month or a few months and like they'll see a lot of results and they'll kind of rebound off of it. That's totally true too. I think in a, I think it would be good to actually normalize that as not a failure. It's it's actually okay. Like if if your goal is, hey, I want to aggressively lose weight within a time period. I've seen people have success with it where they do the strict keto diet and they do it for 90 days. They get their results and you need to be careful about off boarding off of it to, I don't think you should rebound to like full on standard American diet. But if you rebound, if you start bringing carbohydrates back into your life, you're still maybe doing low carb, but you're like watching out for things like, Hey, salad dressing can have a lot of sugar in it. Hey, like, you know, straight fruit juice, you think it's healthy for you, but there's actually a ton of sugar in like a glass of apple juice. It's not this like health, it's not healthy for you. Like you maybe thought that that journey of having spent 90 days doing the keto diet and maybe you wear a continuous glucose monitor, like a levels is great. They're, they're friends. Or there's also NutriSense. Like you wear one and you get, you get aware of what your blood glucose is doing throughout the day. Do you have to do keto every day for the rest of your life? I don't know. Maybe you hit your goals within 90 days and then you come back to a more like moderate, I'm still going to have birthday cake on my husband or wife's birthday. But as a general rule, I'm a lot more carb aware than I was before my 90 day journey. And then other people just love keto diet. Like there are, there's a segment of people that just like, they're never going to touch a carb. It's their happy place and they love it and more power to them. And I've, I've heard from some people that the keto diet isn't always great for women and it can kind of mess up their hormones and their metabolism. And I don't know if you are familiar with those schools of thought. Yeah, it's, it's definitely as a layer of complexity on it, where like, if you're trying to get pregnant and your body thinks you're in like, like, you, you know, you're low on carbs and it might think you're, you're starving. You might feel great. You might feel really energized, but you might have a harder time getting pregnant. Like it can have some connection with hormone levels that affect women in particular. I think if you're doing it for like an extended period of time, good to check in with doctor or registered nurse or someone who has experience with people who are like you and can help you guide you through the process and understand the, the different pitfalls and different ways to support it as well. I agree. And I think even when you, you talked a little bit about intermittent fasting and that's something that, you know, obviously is another buzz, you know, kind of word. And I have a lot of friends and just clients asking me about it, you know, and what is it and what should I be doing? And I think with women too, in the hormones, especially I think premenopausal women, that's another factor to consider and that our bodies are just designed differently than the male body, as far as the hormones and what we can do. Um, Cause I've heard a lot of people say, oh, well, my husband's doing keto and I tried it. And now like my cholesterol is off the roof because I was eating like him. Or I think your, your point is valid. Like sometimes these biohacking devices, like you mentioned, the continuous glucose monitors are really good and getting your numbers checked to make sure that you're still in line with what your body needs. But yeah. clearly there's lots of benefits to explore. Just being mindful that you may not be able to do what your friend or spouse or whoever is doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good to track it personally. Like different people have different genetics. They're going to respond to it differently. Different people are at different stages in their life, have different goals. I think, um, it's all, 
everyone's at a unique scenario and it's helpful that I'm, I think one of the cool things going on is the proliferation of personal health hardware devices, like levels, like sleep trackers, like different at home devices that are, that are relatively affordable that let you track your heart rate variability that let you measure your sleep score, track your blood biomarkers that way you have a more personalized window. And then, yeah, of course, like go, like it's good to go speak with your doctor, your medical professional with a registered nurse and really get the, the deep dive. But I think a lot of times the question has to come from you as the person, as the like pilot in the cockpit of your own life, like yeah. your doc, your doctor or your nurse or whatever is not going to uh, find you necessarily. Mm-hmm. Like you might have to go seek out that person. And it's got to come from you. Like, Hey, I heard that this is interesting. Like, can I try it out? Is, is there a registered nutritionist that can talk me through this? I would like to try it. And like, I think having that like experimental mode, like not assuming anything's going to work or not, but like trying things out with a hypothesis that, Hey, this could work for me, mm-hmm. but don't assume it'll work. Like have some objective checks on it. Like, Hey, am I actually getting the output I want from this? Uh, and, and it can always be good to have some help there. Yeah, that's such great advice. So um, what are ketone esters and, you know, who should consider taking them? Who shouldn't consider taking them? What are the benefits of them? Yeah, ketone esters, ketone drinks are a way to get that same ketone that your body makes, but without needing to do the keto diet. And or doing, you can drink a ketone while you're also doing the keto diet or some grade w- therein. Like you, it delivers that same ketone that your body would make. It's really interesting, right? Because this, this ketone, it's very efficient. It's very metabolically efficient. It turns into cellular energy efficiently. It requires less oxygen to do so. creates less oxidative stress as it's, as it's turning into ATP. So if, and subjectively, it feels really good. Like you feel sharp on it. It also helps with appetite suppression. So you get all these things, right? If you if your body's naturally making a ketone, it's just another tool in the toolkit to have a drink that does this directly. And when we launched this in 2017, and then we started working with special operations command, they're really interested in it because they'll use like, they'll use ketones on top of their normal diet. So not even necessarily replacing, they'll use it on top of as like, basically you can think about like an additional parallel fuel source in and, and really interesting results off of that where people where when we do like a lot of the types of tests are people rucking at altitude with low oxygen, like wearing a heavy backpack and than doing target practice, like shooting drills afterwards. And there we're seeing significant improvement in cognitive ability at when people are in this like exhausted state after a, a tough ruck at altitude. So that context is, is like, you know, totally different from a keto diet. That's people drinking it for phys- peak physical performance, peak cognitive performance during a strenuous mission. So that's a lot of how people are using it too, is this like, you know, we're getting into retail stores. We're in Sprouts. We're in we're in a lot of retail stores, and and a lot of that use case is people just ta- taking it as a no caffeine, no sugar, energy boost, and not you, you don't have to think super hard about am I on the keto diet or not? Am no. I already in ketosis or not? It's just like you can think of ketone as just like the new sugar. It's like sugar kind of gets you this like energy pick me up. You get a sugar rush, but it's also really terrible. It's like it's like coal. It's like dirty coal for your power plant versus ketone. It's like, Hey, it's also direct calories that you directly get a boost out of it, but it's like a clean energy source. That's less metabolically stressful, more, more efficient to use feels really good. Um, so instead of having, you know, a peanut butter cup is an afternoon pick me up or a Coca-Cola or something. It's, you can have a ketone instead without having to like think, think super hard about am I in the keto diet or not already? Yeah. Which I think is so cool because it's just like every, I mean, lots of people do reach for some form of caffeine or sugar in the afternoon. Right. I mean, I guess we did a study. It's probably the peak time sometime in that afternoon hour when they start to get tired. And if you think about even the number of calories in most of those drinks or foods, 
they're high and they're high in sugar or artificial crap, right? And you're like one serving of the ketone IQ is I think it's like 70 calories. Is that right? About yeah. um, it's quick, it's easy, you just take a little shot of it. Um, and not only will it, you know, help with your performance and like you said, the mental clarity, but then it will it's also, and I'm just speaking from my personal experience of using this for the last three days, definitely helps with the satiation. So you're not like you know, have a Coke and then you're also oh hungry for the sugar or the chips after, like it's a ripple effect of what you eat. This is actually suppressing that appetite in addition to helping with, from a cognitive and alertness standpoint. Yeah, that- there, there, there was a really interesting study where they showed that drinking a ketone, elevating your ketone levels lowers ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone. And mm-hmm. it, and when people this is a double blind placebo controlled study where the participant doesn't know what they're drinking or not. They're just fed something by the researcher. The researcher is double blinded. So the researcher just has a code on it. They, they don't know until after the fact, um, half the participants took a ketone half took a placebo that was the same amount of calories. So if you have a hundred calories of ketone, you have a hundred calories of, of a carbohydrate, like a sugar drink, and they showed that after an hour, people felt more satiated from the ketones. They had lower ghrelin, so objectively, when they're doing blood markers, they had lower, lower hunger hormone. And subjectively, when they were asked to report, hey, how hungry do you feel on a scale of 1 to 10, people felt less hungry. So again, it's not this like miracle thing. You can't, you don't, you can't have it on top of a donut and it like un, undoes your, it's not like command Z on your donut. Right. It's... But what it is, is if you have it to replace other things, it's more satiating per calorie. And so that's what's really interesting. And it requires, I think, a little bit of understanding on it where it's not, it, there's still calories in it. There's just like a higher quality of calories. Like you need to eat something throughout the day unless you're just like on some ongoing fast, which is pretty extreme. Like you got to eat something and one general guideline is, is to not treat all calories as equal. Like some Mm -hmm. calories are more satiating than other calories. That's one of the tenets of the keto diet that I personally like strongly agree with. Like you can't, you can, we were talking about it a a couple minutes ago. Like I would rather have like, like eggs than oatmeal for breakfast because I I feel like it's, it fills me up better. Um, Mm -hmm. And in general, like you can lean towards, certain foods are just more, and you can pay attention to your, how you feel about it. Like certain you, when you bring that awareness to it, you can see how you feel from it, that certain types of food is just more satiating per calorie. And yeah, with, with ketones in particular, we've just done the study and seen how a raise in blood ketones directly suppresses appetite. So can we dive in and talk about this latest product, the Ketone IQ? I know it's, <clears throat> excuse me, the second generation of this flagship product, and it was released earlier this year. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So can we talk about, you know, I know we've been talking about the benefits of the elevated ketones, but can you tell our listeners like how you actually use the drink on a daily basis when you use the drink? you know, is it appropriate for anybody to use it? Maybe start there. Yeah. Yeah. So just to begin at the beginning, it's all, it's FDA approved. It's generally regarded as safe. It's like the ingredients in it are all like, like accepted normal ingredients. This isn't some crazy stuff. It has a supplements facts on it. It, We make it in uh, large scale facilities that follow all the rules and do manufacturing for a bunch of other brands that you probably know and and use so all good there and then the general guidance is yeah it's, if you're not exceeding three and a half servings a day you're fine that over time is going to go up that's like the most conservative it will ever be because it's relatively new like w- that's going to push up and up where uh, yeah, i personally have had more than that i would say the whenever a product is new to market all the guidelines around it are are conservative it's like don't it don't exceed more than a few drinks a day. I think that's a good guideline. And then as it's on market for longer and the, and people are um, having a good time with it, we can we can bump that up over time. Uh, specifically how to use it, I have it in the morning. So like I, I put it next to my coffee or I like athletic greens. Like it was kind of a few things that you have in the morning 
to get yourself set up well for the day, I'll have it then. And I, I don't have like a big breakfast or anything. That's kind of, that is pretty much my setup. I'll have black coffee. I'll have athletic greens. I'll have ketone IQ and it helps to, it helps me to extend my overnight fast. Like I like to have that eating window where I'm eating mainly within six or eight hours. So when I have that breakfast, it's like, you know, the only source of calories is just a small amount of calories in the ketones. And then I'm good. Like I, I'm satiated until lunchtime and I'm in ketosis. I have these elevated ketone levels. I feel really dialed in at work, really good energy levels, not hungry. And then for lunch, I'll usually have something, you know, not super high carb. I'll have yogurt and I like salmon a lot. I'll have eggs. I have like, I'll try to have something that's, that kind of follows general low carb principles and then for dinner time, I usually like less rules, like more, less restrictions, like dinner, I'm more loose. Cause I don't really care if I'm sleepy after dinner, if I'm a little like sleepy from having some carbs, like well, that's okay. That's dinner time. Uh, so that's kind of the flow of my day. I try to like start the day really, um, like clean, low carb, have some ketones, have a couple other things and then, and then flow through that throughout the day. And then, and then dinner is more of like a let loose meal. So would you say, um, you're doing it once a day in the morning? I also will have it like throughout the afternoon. Like I'll have like another second or third drink, like in that afternoon, like two, 3 PM, uh, I'll sip on it. Just, it feels good. I can't, it's, it's, again, it's that thing where, so I, I don't have any coffee after breakfast. Like I, I don't have any coffee after noon. It's just a rule I have because I think myself, like many others, when I'm wearing my aura ring, if you're wearing a whoop apple watch, whatever it yeah. starts, like you can see like your sleep scores. And one of the biggest things for me yeah. personally, and I know a lot of other people is that if you have caffeine too late in the day, it can really interfere with that or too much mm -hmm. and, or too late in the day. So I don't touch caffeine afternoon. You could probably tell by now I'm not, I'm not having peanut butter cups as my like go-to pick me up in the afternoon. <laughs> so I like I'm on most days, right? Like I like the ketone IQ for that reason as a afternoon pick me up that doesn't have caffeine in it, doesn't have any sugar. I just feel kind of nice. And then I don't really crash from it. I just, will just sip on it. Mix it. I like to mix it too. Okay. So I think elephant in the room too, is it tastes kind of crazy. I think you were very polite for not mentioning that, but yeah. it tastes, a little, it tastes it, like, I was a little shocked by the taste. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it tastes like gin or something. It, yeah. And I, I mix it yeah. with, I like to mix it with like, a few, you mix it with, uh, like soda water, you can mix it with okay. diet Coke, uh, or like Olipop, some of the more like healthier, like diet Cokes, I know it's kind of problematic, but <laughs> like Olipop, uh, or Poppy or some of those more like new, healthier, better yeah. for you soda Sodas. options that are, yeah, low, try to go for something lower sugar, but it, it, you can find things where it actually mixes really well, the same way that you would like a nice mixed alcoholic cocktail, like straight gin doesn't taste awesome, but if you mix it with the right, right. thing or two, like straight mezcal, maybe it tastes crazy, but in a nice <laughs> cocktail, you can make it taste good. Uh, same with ketones. Like I, I always, I always like to try out a couple of different mixers and see what it works with. So I, I will full disclosure. I did mix it with a smoothie one morning and it was interesting. <laughs> I, I think so. I bet, I bet it didn't taste great. Like I, okay. So I will just say like, I don't put it in my coffee. I think it ruins coffee. I think if you put it in a smoothie, it might ruin your smoothie. I think if you put it into a, uh, like Olipop lemon ginger, it tastes fantastic. I will say like, oh. if you put it into a like soda bitters, like I have this brand of soda bitters that I really like it tastes really good. So like there's certain things it doesn't go with it. it the way I think about it is like, if, if you would mix like vodka or whiskey or some alcohol with it, it will probably taste good, but I wouldn't necessarily mm. put like vodka in my smoothie would probably taste yeah. good too. <laughs> so <laughs> listeners out there, you know, I think we're hearing that, you know, have a dash of vodka in the morning with your right. <laughs> shot of ketone. I'm totally kidding. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, one way to think about it is like, what if, what if, what if there was a version of al alcohol that was good for you? Like what if, you could have like a healthy aperitif, like an afternoon cocktail, but it's not alcohol. It's actually like this metabolic super fuel. And yeah, you mix it with a little bit of 
soda and a squeeze of lime and you make it's kind of nice i i like yeah. this it's that same ritual and craft around making a nice cocktail but it's not i, I don't i don't want to be drinking a cocktail every day at 3 p.m either yeah personally. you know i heard i heard somewhere something i was listening to in preparation for this interview they were talking about it like is as if it's a cocktail and now really the non-alcoholic cocktail if you will movement is is big and this it's also huge. provides some health benefits in addition to just being a potentially sugary drink that happens to not have alcohol in it, right? So I'm going to try it. Like yeah. I, I tried it three different mornings, um, twice before a workout and once after because I forgot. I just took a shot of it. I didn't even think about mixing it. So I'm definitely going to have to try it later in the day. But I will say I noticed my, and I wasn't trying to do any sort of crazy extended fast, but I went like 16 hours, which I never have done before in my life by taking this. And normally I like do a 13, maybe, maybe 14 hour fast, but I went like an additional two hours. And Marty and I are both running our seven day um, functional medicine liver detox right now. So I'm already restricting a lot of different foods anyway. So I was shocked that I went that long on top of it. Just as my own little personal science experiment. I'm still going to try this in a few different ways, but um, I I was, I was impressed. I have, it's never happened to me before. So there you go. And I'm going to be on a mission to find something to mix it with that doesn't have sugar, that's not soda, and that's not bad for you and in other ways. Do you have Alipa in I Yeah, we do because my I kids actually have never I've, heard of it. Oh, you've never heard of it? So I bought it for my kids. I mean, we don't buy soda ever, but I was like, oh, it's kind yeah. of like a treat. So I have bought it and my daughter's tried it a couple of times. I haven't tried it yet. I just bought it for them. I mean, it's obviously much more expensive than regular soda, but- it, yeah, as, a tr- as a tree, it's mu- it's way, way, way better. I mean, it doesn't compare ingredient wise to. Yeah, it's got no, it's got none of the sugar or like one or two grams yeah. of the sugar. And then if you compare it to Diet Coke, you know, I think Diet Coke has kind of a crazy brand around it where it's yeah, they took out all the sugar, but it's got a bunch Chemicals. of crazy sweeteners in Chemicals. there. Yeah. <laughs> so Olipop, uh, they they figured it out like it, the one drawback is it's more expensive. I think you get what you yeah. pay for there. Where like they figured out a way to make something that tastes great uh, and is low sugar mm-hmm. and has other it has like probiotics, like probiotics other functions. in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it ends up being I, I don't know exactly what it'll be at you know a Target in your in your town, but it'll be you know, three bucks instead of one one dollar. Um, but yeah, the lemon ginger olipop tastes really good mixed with it, and or if you have like, just like soda water. Yeah, and with, like a with splash, lines, splash, splash, splash of bitters. Splash, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, I'm on so, a mission. Me too. So what what is the downside of this product? The downside is what I've said before, where it's not going to magically like undo what you're eating already. Like you can't use it. If, if you use it on top of like your completely normal diet, it's, a, it's not going to do anything for you. Like the point of it is that it should help you to suppress appetite across the rest of your life and, or it should help you have more energy for your workouts or like a way to feel energized for your workouts without having to have like a super carby pre-workout snack. Like, like that's kind of, that, that would be like counteracting a lot of the, the good parts of, of your workout. So it's the downside is that it's not that it's not this like magical panacea thing that <laughs> that just melts the pounds away I, I wish it kind of right? sounds like it is but I I'm glad it can you're be. clarifying it's just, it's, that no it's <laughs> it, yeah it's it, it can help you it's just you need to also do do the work and be mindful um of of everything else that you're doing like I would say like try to do a eating window try to have like some hours in the day that are more game on for eating and others hours in the day where you're not eating during and try to stick to it and then if you can use ketone iq to help you adhere to that like cool that's great uh but you like you, you have it has to also come from you on having some structure around it if you just have like your complete normal breakfast and then ketone iq on top it's like well it's it's not going to deliver anything like it, yeah. you got it you have to like hey let me try having a later breakfast or like pushing mm-hmm. my eating window around and using this as part of that so yeah, that's a major dropping is it is that there's a little bit of, of like understanding around it. It doesn't just like magically deliver results, which is good because nothing magically delivers results. Right. And there needs to be a right. little bit of like mind, mindfulness and, and work and effort around 
figuring out what works for you. So thinking about like performance athletes or like, I'm sure we have a lot of listeners out there that are training for marathons right now with the spring and summer season of coming up as we record this, how would say like a marathon runner best use this if they're not planning to be in ketosis and they're still going to, you know, ha- enjoy carbs. Right. Um, what would be a good like protocol for them? Oh yeah. We can do another hour on just marathon <laughs> running. That's my, <laughs> one of my favorite, favorite topics. And Running is so beautiful, by the way, because it's so simple. It's like, you're, it's so simple. Like it's a subcomponent of other sports, right? Like you're playing soccer or tennis or anything else. Like you're running around a lot and you also are caring about 18 other things. I was a varsity soccer guy in high school and, and loved it. There's something about running where it's like so zoomed in on running, but once you zoom in on running, there's actually within running, there's like 18 different things to care about, about your mechanics and your form and your shoes and I, like running, running with different shoes on different days of the week so that you're, you have strong feet that aren't overfit to any one type of shoe doing heart rate based training, like doing certain different types of running to work on different parts of what kind of runner you are doing speed work on some days, doing endurance work on other days. So a lot to cover there really specifically. What I'd say is, is that a lot of people, when they're training for a marathon, there's this, I, if we just take the race day of, you know, you got, you got your, your local marathon coming up. A lot of times you're doing you know, 12 or 16 week build up to it. You're training. It takes a lot of work to do a marathon. Uh, you should definitely build up to it. And usually the last week of the build up is, is one of the funnest where like you, you're, if you have a 12 week training program, usually like you train hard for 11 weeks and then your 12th week, you're supposed to kind of chill out. It's called taper week. And you're supposed to like take it easy because you basically want to get super fit over 11 weeks. But like if you're training a lot, you're also, you're gonna be really fit and really tired. And so you need a week where you relax, regain all of your energy and strength, but you still have very high fitness. Like that fitness hasn't gone away yet, even though you've been kind of taking it easy for a week. And then in that week, a lot of people talk about carb loading that, you know, 48 hours, 36, 24 hours before a big race, like you want to make sure that your body has a lot of glycogen stores. So you want to intentionally eat pasta, pizza. You want to get like, like your body can has like battery packs of glycogen. Glycogen is stored glucose. You want to fill up your battery packs as much as possible in the couple of days before a race. And then race day morning, you want to have some more carbs, have some bananas, oatmeal, coffee, um, have some carbs and caffeine. And I would add to that mix ketones. I would have ketones also before the race, like an hour, half hour beforehand. Cause the way to think about it for a marathon runner is that you have different types of pathways for your energy and like carbohydrates are one pathway. And there's like sub there's different types of carbohydrates that, that you can have that you want to kind of vary the types of carbohydrates uh, a lot of like goo, goo shots and stuff. The, the whole reason those are cool is because they have like six different types of carbohydrates. They all get metabolized slightly differently and in parallel. Ketones are like this separate channel altogether from all of those carbs. So you can think about it like, okay, I want carbs and I want ketones. I want to be like a Prius. I want to have battery, yeah. but also yeah. gas. Like yeah. I want to have both. And then you just have full metabolic flexibility across all of them. And then during the race. Yeah. A lot of times you know, have goo. If you have a water bottle or a, a, a ability to like drink something along the way, try to have, continue having that mix of carbs and ketones, full spread of inputs into your metabolism. Can I ask you That's, a question about yeah. that? So thinking about, okay. So in that instance, you're talking about marathon runners. I'm thinking now about my senior in high school daughter who has a track meet this afternoon. Last night, they had a pasta party for their team. Today, she has a race, you know, her races start at 4 p.m. or something. I know they're doing bagels. Um, So could an 18-year-old girl take a shot of a ketone? And would that help her in her performance in a shorter race? Like, let's say it's a 400 or whatever. That's a very good question. And I would say no, that basically ketones are meant more for longer exertion efforts. The shorter your exertion, the more energy that you need at once, the more that that's glucose dependent. So at 400, like that's over in a minute, minute and a half. Ketones, the 
the one drawback on them is like they're they're very efficient for like longer efforts. Okay. So it's it's a way to think. What's a good analogy on it? Like uh, they're not the they're not like the quick snappy energy that you would need for a 400. They're the like slow burn, super efficient where part of what happens, part of why we're even talking about marathoning is that you can't store enough glycogen to run a marathon. Like your body can only store a limited amount of carbohydrates as glycogen. And that glycogen, it's like super quick. Like your body can use it and you fire and you go and like, that's just powering you for a 400. That's what's powering you for the first part of a marathon, but at a certain point, your glycogen stores start depleting on a longer effort. Your glycogen stores start depleting and your body needs other fuel sources and you can make ketones, but they are relatively slower to make than that glycogen, but they're very efficient. And so you can like, Mm. that's how humans are able to like endurance hunt. Like we can walk over a 24 hour period. Humans can walk further than a horse can go. You think of horses as being like these super like stamina animals, but humans actually have better endurance than any other animal over a 24 hour period because we're really good at making ketones. You can't go at 400 meter track speed for that amount of time. So you have these different energy systems for quicker, shorter bursts. You're going to be more glycolytic, more glucose dependent for longer extended activity. You're going to be more, more using more ketones. And that's where a ketone drink is going to be more impactful. I think you explained that really well. That makes a lot of sense. Um, But you also, you know, for those, I mean, obviously there's some performance athletes out there listening, but then there's other people interested in weight loss, but I know it also helps with recovery as well. Yeah. The recovery is possibly more interesting than the performance side. And that really gets into it for people who are exercising like daily or nearly daily where it really is important to like bounce back. So a lot of serious high school athletes, college plus, you know, semi pro, like people, people are pretty serious about their uh, athletic pursuits, obviously professional athletes too, where there was a study done in Belgium with, with, uh, it was a cycling study where they basically imitated similar to tour de France conditions where that cyclists training every single day for three weeks, twice a day, And they had two different groups. They had ketone group and a placebo group. And they showed that in the group that was having ketones that at the end they were, they had 15% higher training volume. And in the final time trial, the ketone group had 5% better performance. So that's where it gets really interesting where it's not just Mm -hmm. just like this magical speed juice that you have like on race day, but that like the compounding benefits and what's behind the curtain on that, the mechanisms of action on it are that if you have ketones after exercise, they seem to help accelerate muscle protein resynthesis. So they help your muscles to rebuild quicker. And they also help with muscle glycogen reuptake. This is on top of if you have your post-workout smoothie, so that already has carbs and proteins in it to help you recover. If you have ketones on top of it, you can think of ketones as a multiplier on that where they basically help that recovery drink like stick quicker so if you did a workout today or you're doing two a days or like right you did, we're talking about not not someone who's going to the gym twice or three times a week as much but someone who's like working out a bunch you're working out once or twice today once or twice tomorrow the next day next day like the your first goal as soon as you're done with today's workout is to start recovering for tomorrow's workout that's where ketones like, start being super interesting where they accelerate mm-hmm recovery speed and general recovery ability. Cause I can tell you like the way you get to running six minute miles in a marathon, isn't by like trying really hard on race days. Like race day was almost easy. Like for me, like to not to, I don't know. It wasn't, I'm not bragging on it, but the point is that what was hard was like 16 weeks of prep of running every single day and you're tired and then you're recovering and you're doing it again. And you need to like be right on that red line every day where you're not trying to be a hero on any given workout, you're right on that red line. And then you're, you're going just hard enough that you're getting a training benefit, but you're able to bounce back and recover and do it again the next day. And that red line slowly increases day by day, week by week. And a big part of that is having the best nutrition, right? If you do a workout and you don't eat well 
you don't eat optimally afterwards, you're kind of toasting yourself for the next day. So ketones are interesting in there where if they're this multiplier on top of your post workout nutrition, then it helps the whole equation. It helps. It's like another, you know, you have interest in your savings account, right? You're trying to compound your workouts, compound your savings account. It's like another few interest points on your compounding workouts. Yeah. That's so cool. So I just have one question. You mentioned protein and like that mus- muscle protein synthesis. Mm-hmm. So you're saying like when you do a heavy strength workout and I've just been more into this the last like six months, pretty intense, but only like a half hour workout. And they're always like, get your 20 grams of protein within 20 minutes after your workout. Um, so you're saying keep with the protein, but then add the ketone IQ to it and it'll help with recovery in between and also just help with building more muscle. Did I hear you correctly? Yes. It helps with the muscle protein synthesis. Okay. Interesting. So, and just so I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, it really does matter what you're trying to achieve with this product like the time of day you take it. So if you want yeah. to work with your fasting window, maybe you're taking it in the morning, but if you want to work on your protein muscle synthesis, maybe you're taking it after a strenuous recovery, a workout, right. <laughs> after a strenuous workout. Am I saying that right? Yeah, you're saying it exactly right. If you need a, you know, some an energy boost late in the day, maybe that's when you're taking it. So there's like different ways to use the product at different times. Yeah, a hundred percent. If we got one thing across on this episode, I'm glad it's that. It's like this simple, dumb dumb answer that I would say is like have it first thing in the morning. But if you double click on it, there's like a lot of nuance, and I think you you said it really well, Marnie, which is. It depends. Like, it depends how what you're trying yeah. to use it for. Are you using it for an afternoon pick me up? Are you using it for a workout recovery? Like, there's a lot of devils in the details on it. It's like anything. I think going back to the initial thesis of what we're doing here, why ketones are so interesting. Like, look, like I, four out of my fr- five friends like don't know what a ketone is. Like, what? Like, <laughs> well, by this time they do. Yeah. I talk a lot, but <laughs> like, like. Most people like aren't like waking up in the morning. Oh my gosh, I need a ketone. Like it's still this very narrow segment of people that like know what it is or getting these benefits. And within that segment, we're just seeing like massive excitement around it. And our whole thesis as a company is that ketones are a nutritional primitive. When we think about collagen, CBD, whey protein, yeah. omega-3, right? We think of these like, and what all of these have in common is as functional ingredients or nutritional primitives or whatever we want to call it is that they're like that point that you just said, Marnie, which is like, there's no one reason why people use it, right? Like, why do people have protein? Like, I don't know, like 65 year old might have it because they're dealing with age related muscle loss and they need to make sure they're having enough protein per kilogram of body weight. Totally different story from a 23 year old that's trying to bulk up totally different story from someone who's like recovering from an injury and wants to make sure they have enough protein. Right. Like, so it's a primitive and there's, a, we all have muscles in our body. So there's a lot of different reasons and context why someone might want a protein supplement. We're doing the same with ketone where the mission is, Hey, if, if this can be a tool in everyone's toolkit, not everyone's going to be using it the same way, but if it's a tool in the toolkit where every grocery store that you walk into, you can grab a ketone, you can you make people understand how and when and where and why to use it then we'll have accomplished our mission. Well, I think you're like the fourth macro, it sounds like, right? It's like people are focused on their fat, their protein, their carbs, and oh, did you get your ketones today too? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a great way to think about it. It's a source <laughs> of calories where, where you have, you know, carbs have calories, protein has calories, fat has calories, ketones are this new entrant. It's really interesting, actually. Like we kind of break the nutrition facts panel on our product because like it, there's calories, but you go line by line, like protein, carbs, fat, zero, zero, zero. And there's like not a line. And like, we're not in charge of our nutrition facts panel, right? Like the FDA defines what lines there are, but because of ketones are kind of new, like <laughs> all, all, like you have to be accurate around, about the number of calories, but you also have to be accurate about the number of proteins, carbs, and fats. And like, those are all zero two. So it's like <laughs> zero, 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 but then the sum is, is 70. So I think that I, I, I don't, have any special knowledge on what the FDA is doing or not, but I think that they will, 
encourage or accept the new line of reporting and the nutrition facts to be able to talk about ketones as a source of calories. Yeah. Super interesting. Um, so Michael, as we start to wrap up this conversation, which I feel like we could go on and on, I still have more questions. Um, mm -hmm. but I want to be mindful of your time today. We love leaving our listeners with just some few simple tips or strategies that they can immediately implement into their lives. And so what are, what's one or what are one or two things that, um, you have for someone that may be interested in exploring a more, you know, a ketogenic light diet or just introducing ketone esters and of course your product. Yeah, I would say try out one of those continuous glucose monitors. So see what your body is doing to respond to the different inputs in your diet. See how you're responding to different things that you eat. See how your blood biomarkers that relate to your metabolic health and performance. See how those biomarkers are responding to your diet, your workouts, your sleep, right? Like when you don't get enough sleep, your body, it, your metabolism isn't functioning as well. Like it's harder for you to clear high blood glucose levels. So try out a continuous glucose monitor, like go through this test. We, we really like levels. There's a few other good ones out there. Um, try it out. See for yourself. I hope ketone IQ is part of the overall picture, but even more to the core of it, you know, see for yourself what metabolically healthy looks like. So like you get develop that intuition around how you feel when you're not overly sugared up. And when you have ketones instead, like get an intuition around that. And I think you'll see a lot of what I, I've been talking about the whole time here. I'm like, okay, yeah, it's a lot of those days where I feel good and not sleepy. And I feel really sharp. Like those tend to correlate to days where I had a more metabolically healthy diet and lifestyle in the preceding one to two days. It's funny because Stephanie and I have both experimented quite a bit with the levels, continuous glucose monitors, and I found it to be so informative in terms of different eat ways of eating and even just movement after food and whatever. So mm -hmm. it would be really interesting to see how the ketones affect that as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know. We're friends with them over there. And Casey Means, their, their research lead teaches a class at Stanford. I just guest lectured over there as part of that. So it's, yeah, we're all, I would say climbing the same hill, but different paths where they're yeah. coming much more from a hardware perspective, obviously. Mm -hmm. And we're coming much more from a nutrition perspective, but it's all the same overall mission of improving metabolic health and creating tools for people to do so. Yeah. I love, I love all this. So Michael, where can people find you and shop the products? Yeah, our, our brand is called Health Via Modern Nutrition. So you can check us out at hvmn.com. You can also Google for Ketone IQ or HVMN. My name is Michael Brandt. I'm super active on social media. So you can find us at HVMN. You can find me personally. I'm at BDM underscore runner. And I'm active on Twitter and Instagram and everywhere. I love hearing from people. And... Yeah, drop, drop me a line out there. And I believe you have a special offer for our listeners. Oh, yeah. We have a special a special code for anyone who's listening in where if you buy through that link, you'll get 10% off. And I'll share that with you right after this. And I think it'll be in the show notes. Yes, it will. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. So, Michael, as we wrap up this super um, fascinating and enlightening conversation, we have one final question that we love to ask all of our guests, and that is, what does the art of living well mean to you? One of my favorite quotes, and I love that question, by the way. One of my favorite quotes is, if you're so smart, why aren't you happy? And that really touched a nerve with me just from my background and being with a lot of like high-powered, ambitious, intelligent, high IQ people that are not necessarily super happy all the time. And it actually raises the question of like, what does it even mean to be smart? Like what, okay, you're smart, but like against what function are you solving? Like what, what are you, what are you doing? If you're, if you're really smart, isn't the, the first thing you should apply that to like your own 
life and lifestyle and everything. Like sometimes people are, are solving these like rocket science level questions at work, but they haven't applied that to their own life and lifestyle. And I think it's a miss. I think like, I, and I don't, I, I don't know what exactly that aha moment is for every individual person, but I would just convey a sense of faith in it that if you're smart at your job, if you're an accountant or a lawyer or a teacher, like everyone's job is really hard and you're putting a lot of IQ and EQ and all that into it, consider putting that also into just your own self and your life and trying out a few different things and developing a plan and having one-on-ones with yourself, maybe the way that you do with your manager or your direct reports and whatnot, like have that with yourself and try to apply your smarts to truly interrogating what a happy life would look like for you and experiment on things. And just like anything else in life, like there's no magic way to get there. You probably have to experiment on five, 10 different things. And then like three of them will actually work. And I just, if I, maybe people need to hear it a hundred different times. And maybe this is just one of those kicks in the pants of one of those 100, but like try and go and get after it for, for your life and figure out how to, how to live happy. If you're, if you're so smart, why aren't you happy? I think it's a good question to ask. I love that. And I think it's so powerful. I love that you said, have a one-on-one with yourself. Everybody can use that time and people don't take it. Yeah. I think sometimes people put themselves in the back seat. People can self-sacrifice. People can put others ahead, which I think can be a value in some ways, but I think it's the best way that you can be there for your family. Like I just had a, a, a daughter, right? Like a 10, she's 10 weeks old. She's in the oh, congratulations. Room. Congrats. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, and you know, the best way you can be there for your family and for your community and your team and all that is you need to be a strong community is made of strong individuals. The strong family is made with comes from having strong parents, right? So like self-sacrificing to make your community, family, team stronger it crumbles at a certain point. Cause if you're self-sacrificing too much, you're no longer a pillar within what you need to hold up like the, And so it's not this selfish thing, like taking care of yourself is where it all begins so that you can be there for the people around you that matter. It's not this like selfish thing to spend an hour, hour and a half like, every day to like, do something active every day, right? Like, like go for a walk or jog or wait, like, like that's not a selfish thing. Like that's part of you showing up in service for your team, your community, your family. It's not selfish. It's okay to spend time being there for yourself. That's that's where it all starts. Healthy community is made with healthy, with healthy people. Amen. (laughs) Yeah. Beautiful. And what better way to end this, this conversation? Um, Thank you so much, Michael. Um, We're Marnie and I are both excited to continue to experiment and use um, ketone IQ and can't wait for our listeners to as well. Great. Thanks for having me on. Thanks everyone for listening in. Have a great day. Thank you so much for listening to the Art of Living Well podcast. We are so grateful that you joined us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or anyone else you think may benefit from this information. We'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and tag the Art of Living Well podcast on social media. If you want more inspiration in between episodes, you can find us on social media at the art of living underscore well on Instagram and Facebook, where we will share snippets from our daily lives and our journey to living well.